Hi Zephyr, I know you're watching this because you're paid to break fair use law. I just want you to know that whatever claims you put on this video to block it, I'm going to battle and I'm going to win. Because I have the law on my side. And I also want to say fuck you for literally putting a strike on my account for my video on the first Jurassic World. Despite it being completely fair use. All of the relevant footage in this video is from your publicly available trailers that I found on your channel on YouTube. So before you waste my time, giving me a strike or claim that your stupid ass nose is false, just know that if you have a wife, she's probably riding some black guy's dick at the moment, and when you go home tonight from your boring piece of shit job in the middle of nowhere, you will eat reheated Kraft macaroni and cheese, and wallow in self-pity before opening up your grinder account and searching for dick. Because I know what you know, and what I know is that you are a faggot, and you like dick almost as much as I do. And don't worry, I'll make sure to put plenty of complimentary phalluses on screen for your enjoyment. Since being a dickhead yourself, cock is probably the one thing in life that you're actually knowledgeable on. So please, don't waste my time striking my video. But, since I know you're gonna do it anyway, allow me to deliver a message. I know who you are. I know what you want. But if you're looking for me to delete my videos, I can tell you I'm a stubborn fuck and won't do that. What I will do is send you gay fox yif. Gay fox yif I have acquired over a very long hour of searching on E621. Gay fox yif that makes me a nightmare for faggots like you. If you release my video now, that'll be the end of it. I will not spam you. I will not secretly wish death upon you. But if you don't, I will spam you. I will secretly wish death upon you. And I will yiff you. Jurassic World 2 is so dumb, I think I lost brain cells watching it. I know I've probably said this about a hundred movies at this point, but this time I actually mean it. I mean, I meant it for all the other times too. But this time is different, because I was actually on the verge of walking out of the theater about halfway through this movie because I would have rather fucking killed myself than suffer through it. Sadly, I'm forced to entertain the lot of you, so I stayed in my seat and let Universal Studios drag me through this goddamn fiery catastrophe. So the movie begins on a dark and stormy night where I guess they retconned the first Jurassic World movie by making the fishboy pen way fucking bigger. The objective is for a small team of people to go saw off one of the bones to the surprisingly very well-preserved Lizard Boy to make a new Lizard Boy, which is totally a surprise given that we were told by the promotional material that we'd get a new one and they advertised the shit out of it in like every trailer. Kinda breaks the mystery and tension, but okay. So anyway, they open up the sea gates and- wait, what? So... There's just a gate between the open ocean and the fish boy pen? Why? I mean, I imagine that when the park was operational, they needed to funnel the fucking thing out so they could perform maintenance inside its enclosure. Sure, that's fine. But why in the hell would they just have gates leading to the ocean that can be opened by fucking anyone? Keep that in mind, I'm coming back to it later. Wouldn't you have a room to funnel it into that's further inside the island? Why would you ever give it the chance to just swim out to the open ocean? That makes absolutely no logical sense. Setting aside the fact that its enclosure is grown like thrice its size since last we saw it. Why the hell would anyone think this was a good idea? Hell, look at the size of this fucking thing. It could easily bash its way through that wall after a long time with no maintenance. Anyway, so a tiny two-man sub goes in through the doors because I guess they didn't think of just dropping them inside the enclosure directly. This is so fucking inconsistent. One of the guys in the sub tells the other guy not to worry because everything in there is long dead. But at the end of this scene, they make it a serious point to make sure that they close the doors again is if they're afraid of something getting out. Not getting out by land, mind you, this literally just bars the fish boy enclosure from the sea. So, do they think it's alive or not? Hell, rather than just bringing the sub back up directly when they cut off the bone, they have this fucking stupid balloon thing shoot up to the surface as if there was the possibility of them not making it back out. So, what the fuck was it? Did you think it was alive or what? And if you thought it was alive, then why the hell didn't you just send in an unmanned sub down there? Fuck, we had unmanned subs investigate the Titanic. Why the hell would we bother using real humans anyway? Even if it was dead, there's no reason at all to do it like this aside from to have an ominous kill scene at the beginning of the movie. So anyway, back at the surface, there's a guy doing... something? 
I don't really know, to be honest. But a T-Rex is lurking nearby and thus begins a really dumb chase scene. Before that, though, he starts closing the gate with his iPad, but the T-Rex steps on the iPad and keeps the gate from closing. You'd think that just hitting the close the gate button would do the trick, but no, if the connection isn't strong enough, I guess the gate just gets stuck open indefinitely. What an amazing design flaw that would totally allow the fish boy to get out. Oh yeah, and the guys in the sub get predictably eaten. As if fucking any of you didn't see that coming a goddamn light year off. So the T-Rex stumbles around like an idiot and allows the guy to almost get free, but not so fast. The T-Rex grabs the ladder on the helicopter and pulls it away. Somehow the helicopter is not at all affected by it tugging viciously on the ladder aside from not being able to get away. The pilot says to cut the ladder and by the way, the T-Rex is just whipping its fucking head around. You'd think that the helicopter would start swaying at least a little bit. That or the guy who was hanging onto the ladder would at the very least least have been shaken off, but the T-Rex just rips off the bottom half of the ladder and they fly away all happily for about five seconds before the fish boy jumps out to catch the guy in one of the funniest moments in the whole movie. Does the fish boy just sense shit like it has the force? How does it always know when there's something above it to eat? Even if there's no fucking indication that there's anything there, nothing touching the water or anything, it just fucking knows. Does it have its eyes trained skyward permanently just in case? For that matter, how the fuck did it survive this long? It's been like three years between the ending of the first movie and the beginning of this one's main plot, right? Okay, so there's an unknown gap between the beginning of the plot and this little prologue, but we'll give it leeway and say it's a year. Okay, so two years have gone by and no one has fed this fucking thing. How the hell is it still alive? Because the movie's never indicated that there was some other food supply around. Has it just been jumping up and catching shit that happens to fly overhead? Because that's awfully fucking convenient. The biggest fish in the world today, the whale shark, eats up to 46 pounds of plankton per day, and those things are anywhere between a third to half as large as the fish boy. If they need to eat 46 pounds of plankton per day, then how the hell does something two to three times its size survive for two years without anything? Uh, I'm sure I'll have some smart ass in the comments who will be like, ugh, why do you not do your research, wolf? Don't you know that the Muslim Saurus can survive on harem alone? Hello, Akbar! Then we jump ahead to CNN where they're talking about the volcano on Isla Nublar and how it's conveniently become active again. I haven't read the book, but people told me that they use geothermal energy to power the island and dormant volcanoes can come back, I guess so fine, whatever. Seems a tad bit convenient that there's a volcano so powerful it can literally obliterate the entire island and for plot reasons now it's come back alive, but fine, whatever. Maybe we'll get a good disaster movie at least. That or it'd only be about 40 minutes of this entire fucking movie. So Ginger Bitch is back and is a completely different character now. She now runs a PETA organization where they fight for the lives of the dinosaurs, even though they, you know, eat everyone that they come across. Hashtag Dino Lives Matter. Anyway, the sexiest man alive, Jeff Goldblum, is back and better than ever. He reprises his role as Ian Malcolm and you can totally tell in the promotional material that they were really banking on people watching this movie because he was in it. He's in it for like less than a minute, not even fucking kidding. I think fucking Will Turner had more involvement in the last shitty Pirates of the Caribbean movie than Jeff Goldblum had in this. And you can also tell by his fake smile and fake enthusiasm that he totally wasn't doing this just for the paycheck. Jeff Goldblum is in court saying that they should let the dinosaurs go boom because he's the only one in this series that isn't fucking retarded. And because he's not fucking retarded, he understands that killing them would be their best option. Which I think they literally did at the end of the first book, so... The judge takes his logical response and says, no joke, so are you saying this is God's will? And then he goes on the news later and he's like, this volcano is the hand of God. Or or, you know, it's just part of the Earth's natural processes and the people who made the park idiotically placed it on an island with a volcano that's so volatile it will literally obliterate the entire fucking island. But oh no, it's God's will, sure, sure. Ginger Bitch is disappointed by this and calls someone to say that they should save the dinosaurs anyway. Her argument is that their children should not have to live in a world where there are no dinosaurs. So like, almost the entirety of humanity's presence on Earth? And then she gets a call from a guy that she's excited about and goes to his mansion in the middle of nowhere. I don't know what the fuck is up with these shots. Every time there's these sweeping shots of the mansion
mansion or the forest are shown. It's all super fucked up. I can't tell if it's CGI, partially CGI, or just really awful color filters, but something about these shots look really fake beyond reason. Anyway, at the mansion, Ginger Bitch meets this fucking loser and Dr. Hammond. But not the real Dr. Hammond. We get new Dr. Hammond, who is none of the charisma or charm of the real Dr. Hammond, and he's in a wheelchair and for some reason has Hammond's amber mosquito cane, so... So they go in Hammond 2.0's dinosaur exhibit and a little girl mysteriously runs off in plain sight. This is foreshadowing, I hope you caught that. What's that? You don't remember Hammond 2.0? I mean, he's such an important, prominent figure. He was Hammond's second in command. Surely he must have been mentioned. Nope, I guess he just forgot to talk about his incredibly influential business partner that he stopped working on for unknown reasons. Yeah, they literally just made up a new character just to have an excuse to talk about Hammond in this movie. Wonderful. Just gotta fit in some more of that nostalgia placement since that's the only thing that this series has at this point. And Hammond 2.0 says that they need to save the dinosaurs and can do so without congressional approval and can do it right now. So, wait, why didn't you start doing this a long time ago? The movie even makes it a point that the volcano's been steadily becoming more and more volatile over a span of weeks or months. If this was your plan all along, then why the hell didn't you just start when the volcano showed signs of exploding? Why did you wait until just now to- Oh, right, we need a disaster movie sequence. Got it. So anyway, they reveal that they really, really need Blue. Remember her from the last movie? The superhero velociraptor that everyone idolizes because of that retarded-ass fight scene at the end? Well, they need her specifically. Why do they need her? Well, she's super smart. Why is that, you may ask? Because... I don't actually know. The movie pretends like Blue is the second most intelligent creature on the planet. The movie quite literally makes that exact claim. But in both this movie and the last, I don't see how the fuck they came to that conclusion. I guess the writers are just so bad that they had to pull shit out of their ass whenever they need to plot to go forward. They constantly reference Star-Lord's training, but as I explained in my video on the first movie, that training didn't do shit. Blue tries to kill him on three separate occasions in that movie, but they just ignore that because well, they needed to make a second movie. They need to get Blue because she's smart. Why, you may ask? Well, don't expect Ginger Bitch to answer that question because she just goes along with it because she's a vapid fucking idiot that doesn't even bother questioning why they can't just make any other raptor and replicate the same quote-unquote research that Star-Lord performed. Don't you guys understand the scientific method? You know, the shit we do to figure things out? You know, the law of gravity? We replicated things under the same conditions and came to the consensus that gravity exists and found out how it worked. Theoretically, you could, under the same conditions, replicate what Star-Lord did with other raptors. Hell, you could hire Star-Lord again and just have him do the same thing. And even if he refused, you think he's the only one capable of becoming a raptor whisperer? Hell, he even recorded all of this shit. You have a fucking field manual on how to do this. But no, you need to make sure you get the exact same raptor that, for all you fucking know, might actually be dead right now. Wouldn't that have been fun? finding out that the raptor got eaten? Imagine going after its implant and finding it in the T-Rex like the fucking phone ringing in the Spinosaurus in the third movie. Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! God, I hate that movie. Sadly, I hate this one much, much more. So Ginger Bitch goes in search of Star-Lord and finds him in a similarly oddly shot mountainous region where he's building a house. Yeah, just building a random house in the middle of nowhere for no reason with no help at all. And she asks if she can buy him a beer, to which he asks, So, do you have them with you or do we need to go somewhere to do it? Gee, I don't know, Star-Lord. I guess when someone asks if they can buy you a beer, they intend to take you somewhere to buy you a beer, you insolent fucking fool. So they go to a bar together and argue about why they broke up. Yeah, so apparently they broke up prior to the first movie, got back at the end of the first movie, broke up between the first movie and now, and I bet you can guess where their relationship status is gonna be at the end of this movie. This is like almost exactly how Peter Parker and Mary Jane's relationship was in the first three Spider-Man movies. It's over. No. Please. It's kind of like a four-year-old playing with Barbie toys and recklessly smacking their faces together in a kissing motion until the plastic is starting to chip and their noses are flatter than they were when they came out of the box. And it's revealed that Ginger Bitch dumped Star-Lord because he wouldn't let her drive the minivan. Jesus fuck, you really dodged a bullet with that one, Star-Lord. If she's that stuck up of a cunt to leave you over that, phew. She tells Star-Lord that Blue is alive and he needs to help save her, but he rightfully tells her that the dinosaurs should 
all die, but she tells him he's a good man and leaves him there. He then goes home and watches his old videos of training the raptors, which he just has for some reason. Not sure why he bothered to keep those, but okay. Guess we get a nice little cliche of him fondly remembering the good old days so he can recall why he loved Blue so much and convinces him to go get her. I don't remember Blue ever playing this prominent of a role in the first movie. The most defining thing she did was in the last five fucking minutes. Otherwise, she was just another one of the raptors. So the next day, they all board a plane en route to the island and were formally introduced to two of the worst characters in the entire series. Goth Girl, who's an expert at dinosaur biology despite it being that she's never seen a dinosaur before, and Black Guy, who's like, moderately okay with tech in one scene. Star-Lord joins them, obviously, and they all arrive at the exploding island to meet with obvious bad guy who's doing obvious bad guy things like looking obviously bad. I really want to drive home how obvious his bad guy -ness is. He's bad, everyone. Believe me, he's not good. So the plan is that these guys, Star-Lord, Ginger Bitch, and their two friends are gonna try and rescue at least 11 different species of dinosaur and bring them back to the mainland to protect them. Keep this in mind, it's legitimately important and unbearably stupid in context. They briefly stop at the main Jurassic World entrance and we get a total ripoff of the Brachiosaurus scene from the first movie. Welcome to Jurassic Park. So they go to this facility that sits like literally right at the base of the volcano. This is also right where the hamster ball ride was, which is within running distance of the edge of a precarious cliff by the ocean, which was not there in the first movie. Did they retcon the fucking geography of the island? I guess so, because if you look at that big holographic map thing that they had in the first movie and compare it to the 3D model that they show multiple times in this one, the two look literally nothing alike. Unless the 3D model was supposed to be Site B, in which case they just opened up an entirely new can of plot holes. Because if Site B is still a thing, then why don't they just move the dinosaurs there? You can make a new park and everything, come on. Anyway, they hack their way in and Ginger Bitch needs to use her handprint to access the park. The movie makes a big deal out of the fact that only she can do this and only she can access certain levels of the park. So then, why were these random dudes able to open what is arguably the biggest and most dangerous gate in the entire park at the beginning of the movie. Told you I was coming back to that. Anyway, they find Blue pretty quickly and Ginger Bitch and Black Guy stay behind to do... something... I don't fucking know. Star-Lord takes Goth Bitch, an obvious bad guy, to hunt down Blue and Star-Lord finds his compadre out in the forest and Blue's all like, YO NIGGA! YO! Yo! Where you been, homie G? My crack dealer skedaddle is split out for y'all fucked off, and I just been running all up in this hood, motherfucker. What you doing, nigga? And Star Lord throws a thingy at her, and Blue's all like, Nigga, what? Bitch, nigga, what you do that for? This why you white honking motherfuckers need to accept your privilege, bitch. Lizard lives matter. Lizard lives matter. Lizard lives. An obvious bad guy shoots her with a trank, and Star Lord's all like, Shh, we need to pay reparations or she'll start a violent protest. But sadly, he is too late to convey this important piece of information for Blue attacks an alt-writer and gets shot for it. Star-Lord, who literally just watched as Blue tried to viciously kill the man who ended up shooting her in self-defense, rather than taking out his anger on him for provoking Blue, turns to Obvious Bad Guy, who at this point has done literally nothing and tries to attack him. Obvious Bad Guy shoots him with a trank, which is justifiable given that Star-Lord is a muscular boy who wants to give him a hug of violence and thus begins a scene so stupid that I was dumbstruck after watching it. It. So Goth Girl runs up to Star Lord, who she has known for about 10 minutes now, because apparently she's super worried for him after seeing this situation play out. Then, out of fucking nowhere, she takes the pistol that for some reason is next to Star Lord now, when it was the mercenary's pistol who's like 10 feet away, and she turns the pistol toward Obvious Bad Guy. Everyone aims their guns at her when she does this, and Obvious Bad Guy looks understandably bewildered at this strange turn of events, and Goth Girl's like, Nobody should shoot me or the raptor dies. This despite the fact that literally nobody was pointing guns at her or cared about her in the first place. Now she's demanding that she not get shot while being the first one to pull a gun on them, all because Star-Lord overreacted in a perfectly justifiable situation. And now because he's paralyzed, she wants to kill the rest of them for defending themselves from Star-Lord. And obvious bad guys all like, I'll tell you what. 
I'll shoot you if you don't save the raptor. So they tie her and blew up and leave Star-Lord there. Then they fucking betray Ginger Bitch and the Black Kid for no reason by locking them in the facility on the volcano even though they had no idea what happened with Star-Lord and their actions had nothing to do with it. But no, gotta kill them for no reason. Meanwhile, back in America, we're introduced to the 11-year-old American girl who's trying to be a dinosaur and scare her British grandma mom. You may wonder why I called her that. I I want you to take a wild guess and see how accurate you are later in the video. Anyway, she's not actually American, she's British for some reason. And they go talk to her grandpa who is Hammond 2.0 who reads books with mysterious pictures sticking out of the pages. But we aren't allowed to know what those pictures are yet. We need them for the big reveal later. It's a secret! So anyway, back at the island, since we really needed that totally relevant scene, Star-Lord is revived by a Triceratops licking his face for no reason, which I guess stopped to wake him up since the lava is right behind him and the Triceratops knew that he had to live because well, it's Star-Lord. So then, no joke, the lava slowly creeps toward him and Star-Lord hilariously flops around like a fucking fish as he rolls away from the lava which has the sound effect of fucking pudding hitting a tiled floor and by rolling over a fallen tree, he suddenly spontaneously regains all bodily control and can go on a full-on sprint down the mountain. I'm pretty certain that's not how tranks work, especially if the trank is meant to catch a dinosaur. Meanwhile, Ginger Bitch and Black Guy try to find a way out but lava seeps down from above them and then a discount T-Rex comes toward them. I don't remember what the name of the dinosaur is, so I'm just gonna call him Toothy Boy. Toothy Boy is stopped by lava falling from the ceiling and after what we can presume is 20 minutes to an hour of them trying to find a way out, Ginger Bitch looks slightly to the left and sees a fucking ladder leading the way out. How in the hell did you manage to miss that this entire fucking time? So they climb up the ladder and the dinosaur climbs up after them. How does it do that? Well, I wish I knew, because the ladder and the space it goes up into is incredibly narrow, so how the fuck it manages to squeeze its fat ass up the tube is beyond me. Yeah, yeah, the tube breaks and shit, whatever, but it's stone at the top. How the fuck was it still coming up out of the facility with them when there's fucking nowhere near enough room for it to fit in there? For that matter, how did it keep climbing up when the ladder and the rundown machinery around it would have never been able to take the strain of its weight? Oh right, turn off your brain, got it. Tell me, has the phrase turn off your brain ever been used in conjunction with a good movie? You watched 2001 A Space Odyssey, you ever had your friends tell you to turn off your brain for it? Fucking no, if you did that your brain would light on fire. No, the whole turn off your brain phrase is used for bad movies. Done. Finished. That's it. If you need to stop thinking, you're actively telling yourself that the thing you're watching is fucking retarded. But rather than coming to that conclusion, you've turned your brain off to the point where you're literally convincing yourself that this shit is good. No, let me tell you something Thing to all you stupid fucking dipshits that unironically use this line. Using your brain, contrary to popular belief nowadays, is a good thing. If you ever need to tell yourself, I should turn my brain off if I want to enjoy this, then you're watching something that's shit. You know what makes movies like The Room so funny? It's not because you're turning your brain off, it's because your brain can tell you why that movie is horribly broken and unreasonably retarded. Using your brain is what makes that movie funny in the first place. If you shut off your brain, you'd probably think that movie is good unironically and nobody thinks that except for Tommy but he's He's special. Now, I know there's people that really like these movies for some reason, even though the only good one is the first one, and every single following film gets progressively fucking worse to the point that we're stuck with this shit. But seriously, just once, just once, I implore you to please leave your brain switched on. You cannot tell me that this is a good movie. You can't. You fucking can't. I'm not even a fucking third of the way finished with the damn plot yet, and we're at the point where I was ready to walk out of the fucking theater. This this movie was fucking dreadful. Surely you must have seen the same movie. There can't actually be anyone in the world that watched this utterly retarded nonsense and actually thought this was unironically well written. So Star-Lord runs out of the forest with a horde of dinosaurs around him and he, Ginger Bitch, and Black Guy run toward the cliff and conveniently find one of the hamster balls. They hide behind it in two fallen trees which conveniently protect the hamster ball. The dinosaurs then literally conveniently begin chipping away way at the sides of the trees, never once just barreling through the hamster ball itself. No, no, they can smash headlong through the tree, but the hamster ball has to stay in one piece totally unscathed. Isn't that just so 
fucking convenient. Anyway, out of nowhere comes a Carnotaurus. I can guarantee you all remember those from Disney's Dinosaur, the closest fucking thing we've had to a good dinosaur movie since the first Jurassic Park. Rather than running away to escape impending doom, it starts a fight with every living thing around it, and then it gets T-Rex ex machina by a T-Rex that comes out of completely fucking nowhere. How the hell could it have just gone unnoticed this whole time? Oh well, who cares? The T-Rex is the de facto hero of this series, despite also being the thing that, you know, kills a ton of people all the time. So Black Guy and Ginger Bitch roll off the cliff with Star-Lord and the dinos behind them and chasing them all as the volcano's pyroclastic flow. So get this, Star-Lord is caught by the pyroclastic flow and so is Ginger Bitch and the Black Guy, then they all just supposedly fall off a cliff that looks to be roughly 200 feet tall down to the water below. Now, for those of you that don't know what a pyroclastic flow is, allow me to explain. A pyroclastic flow is a fast-moving current of hot gas and volcanic matter that moves away from a volcano at speeds up to 430 miles per hour. These gases can reach up to 1,830 degrees Fahrenheit. When I did research on this, Google even asked the question of, can you outrun them? The answer is definitively, fuck no, bitch. If you're in its path, you don't escape. In terms of what pyroclastic flows are made of, they contain a high density of hot lava blocks, pumice, ash, and volcanic gas. And like I said before, it's 1,830. Really fucking clear here. He would have died instantaneously. No exceptions. There would be nothing left of his fucking corpse to recover. At best, he would be like one of those corpses in Pompeii. The instant that shit touched him, he'd be done for, but he gets by 100% unscathed. Bullshit. And the hamster ball also goes completely undamaged. Bullshit. I don't care how fucking thick that glass is, there is no fucking conceivable goddamn way that it could survive the sheer unbridled destructive power of a motherfucking pyroclastic flow. This movie isn't just retarded, it's bordering on absolute incompetence. It's so beyond the realm of idiotic that I can't for the life of me understand how this wasn't immediately shot down on the cutting room floor. This is like a fucking first grader's first draft attempt at writing a story. This is the kind of dumbassery you'd expect from someone who is literal Down Syndrome. And even that's being insulting toward people with Downs. This is quite literally the stupidest fucking thing I think I've ever seen in the history of filmmaking. The 15 minute stretch between the moment Blue is shot to now is so fucked beyond the bounds of reason that I cannot for the fucking life of me understand how anyone came away genuinely thinking this was a good movie. I have to seriously question how low your fucking standards are if this is what your fucking bar is. And then, then, after bullshitting their way through a completely unsurvivable situation, they fall down this massive fucking cliff. Now, the hamster ball surviving? Fine, whatever. But Star-Lord also survives this fall. Let's just ignore the fact that he could have easily hit rocks at the bottom. Let's just ignore the fact that he definitely should have died in the pyroclastic flow. Now, it's impossible to tell exactly how high this is, although I'm sure some jack-off on the internet will find a way to calculate it a year from now. But from the perspectives it shows us, this looks to be be at least around 150 to 200 feet. The Golden Gate Bridge is 220 feet at its highest point. People have a tendency of killing themselves by jumping off that bridge. If the death rate at the Golden Gate Bridge is 98% and I was not able to find a single instance where a survivor walked away totally unharmed, then it's safe to say that it's also one big pile of shit that Star-Lord survived this fall. Uh, if I stay on this any longer, we're gonna be here for the rest of the fucking day, so I'm just gonna speed through the rest of this stupid-ass scene. Star-Lord shoots their way out of the ball and they end up on the shoreline. Ginger Bitch says they were all betrayed and we get that it was all a lie scene from the trailer. Except it wasn't. I have a theory, and many parts of this movie support it, that there were extensive reshoots and rewrites when making this film. No one has done anything even close to lying to them. The betrayal was out of nowhere. It was spawned from self-defense against Star-Lord, who was in the wrong. The plan is still happening just as they discussed. But here's the real kicker. They figure out, on their own, with no dialogue to support it, that these guys are actually going to end up selling the dinosaurs on the black market. The problem is that at this point, 
point in the movie, not even the audience has been made aware of this. Meaning that there must have been like a solid 10 minutes cut out because this revelation is so out of nowhere that it doesn't make any fucking sense in context. The only other way I can think of this making sense is if they made this line specifically for the trailer. And given that fucking Star Wars has an entire character designed specifically for the trailers, I wouldn't put it past them at this point. Anyway, so they go to the docks and find that goth girl is being held against her will even though she demanded that they take her and not kill her and wow you guys are really grasping at straws to vilify these guys aren't you so the boat's leaving and the volcano's exploding but before they go obvious bad guy does something super important and super retarded he goes up to a spike boy's head and starts wrenching a fucking tooth out of its mouth he has a bit of a teeth fetish i guess anyway they leave one of the cars behind with the keys in the ignition for no reason allowing star lord and the gang to drive off the dock so they can physics 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 into that ship that left its bay doors open for why? Not to mention, they try to remain incognito because they're supposedly on the run from these people now, but there were like a hundred people in this bay. You're telling me that no one saw or heard the truck fly off the dock and into the ship? And I mean like literally fly, hence my little physics rant. Because at a flat surface, the cars somehow arced upward and landed in the cargo bay, even though in reality they would have just plummeted right off and into the water. But instead, everyone's too enraptured by this admittedly haunting and beautiful shot of a a single Brachiosaurus on the docks, looking at them mournfully and crying as it's engulfed by the pyroclastic flow. This is a visually stunning scene. It's also fucking retarded. Why is the Brachiosaurus the only dinosaur that somehow managed to make it to the docks? Where are the rest of the dinosaurs at? Also, why would it even know what the purpose of the boat is or who is on it to give a shit and cry about it leaving without it? And thus ends the first act of this movie and the last point where there's literally anything fucking happening. From this point on, this becomes what is in indisputably the slowest and most boring entry to the Jurassic Park franchise ever. Everything from here on out is a goddamn chore to get through. Right, so back in the mansion, we're introduced to Midget Guy. You may recall him from such iconic roles as the guy in the background of movies you probably like. You probably don't know his name in the movie or his name in real life, and you probably don't know who the hell he is until I point him out in something you like, like, say, Captain America, and then you're all like, oh, I remember him. Who was he again? So Hammond 2.0's son comes to meet him in the dino exhibit and Midget Guy asks where the dinosaurs are. The guy explains they've been taken off the island and they're en route to the mansion now. Midget Guy then says, no joke, they're not here, stop wasting my time. What the fuck? He literally just told you they're on your way. What the fuck do you expect him to do? Fucking teleport them? They'll literally be there that night. They're like six hours away. Why the hell would you pass up this chance because they aren't there now? Is this supposed to be the greatest? greedy rich guy cliche, because this has got to be the worst iteration of it I've ever seen. Even when Hammond 2.0's son starts telling him he can make upwards of 100 million dollars that very night, the guy's like, pfft, that's pocket change. Okay, so why are you even here then? If you weren't previously interested in auctioning off all these dinosaurs and you're completely turned off by the fact that the evacuation is still underway, then why the hell did you even bother coming to the mansion in the first place? Anyway, so the little girl just happens to be in the room so she can listen in on all the super important exposition that Hammond 2.0's son just explains to the midget guy for the audience to hear. Turns out that they just want to auction off all the dinosaurs so all the major countries can have their own little dino monopolies. The little girl is shocked by this and goes to tell Hammond 2.0. She tells them that his son is planning on destroying his life's work and he's all like, Bitch, you must have heard them wrong. I'll fucking deal with them in the morning. Which if you've ever watched a movie in your life, you should know that's not gonna fucking happen. Back on the ship, the gang finds the goth girl in blue, and I guess it took them like six hours to do it. And we find out that blue is hemorrhaging and has been doing so for like 12 hours now. And how exactly is she still alive? The most she's been doing is applying pressure to her constantly bleeding bullet wound. When black guy does it, blood literally sprays in his face. So the flow hasn't stopped, it's just gotten fucking worse. How is blue still alive? At this rate, she should have bled to death by now. Blue is also in the midst of a delirium and is constantly writhing about all like, <laughs> 
Watermelon. Fried chicken. Can y'all get some grape soda for a nigga? They need to take the bullet out, but to do so safely, they need to perform a blood transfusion. I'm not a doctor or anything, but is that fucking true? Could they just have taken the bullet out immediately, stitched her back up, and avoided that process altogether? She's tied down. Why didn't Goth Girl just get two guys to help restrain Blue so she could take the bullet wound out immediately? Hell, you had time to do it on the fucking docks. Why did you wait until nightfall when you were alone to try and save her? Obvious bad guy told you he'd kill you if you didn't save her. Why the hell didn't he throw all his resources at you to help in that endeavor? For that matter, how is this bitch supposed to know what to do and when to do it when by her own admission she's never seen a dinosaur before? How can you be an expert on dino biology when you've never fucking seen one in your entire life? Why is this movie so goddamn stupid? Anyway, they need very specific blood from a predator with no more than three fingers. Seems oddly specific, but okay. Ginger bitch says that she can do it because she's ran a blood drive once. How that qualifies her to siphon blood from a dinosaur, I don't fucking know. Anyway, I'm sure you can guess what dino that is. So they open up the T-Rex crate and dick around for a while, climbing on its head, stabbing it in the side of the face to draw blood and screaming at each other whenever something goes wrong. And all because it's sedated, it hears and feels none of this. But when one of the guards passes by and locks the door, that wakes the T-Rex up. Yeah, okay. So after narrowly escaping death in a very last crusade fashion, kneels before God. <gasps> They give the T-Rex blood to Blue. Okay, I get that the T-Rex and the Velociraptor might be kind of related, and because they're all genetically modified from the same shit anyway, they probably have somewhat similar DNA. So maybe I'm wrong on this, but... There's still two different species. Wouldn't Blue's immune system reject the T-Rex blood, like, immediately? What the fuck? So back at the mansion, again, the girl just happens to wander into the secret lab. Seems like an honest mistake to me. I mean, come on, we have a secret lab under the mansion that has diabolical secrets that could alter the course of the human race. But no, a fucking 11-year-old girl can just accidentally wander into it. I should also mention that fucking Hammond 2.0 doesn't know that this secret lab or all the dino cages beneath it actually exist. So... This whole fucking thing is happening in his own home, and he has no idea about any of it. And the little girl just accidentally finds a computer that happens to have Star-Lord's videos on it where he trains the raptors, and we find out that Blue has empathy like a dog. Okay, right, and how does that change the fact that she tried to kill him three times in the last movie? Anyway, so Hammond 2.0's son and the Asian guy wander down there to give more obvious exposition. It's revealed that they need Blue in order to create their new dinosaur, the Indoraptor. Wow, the creativity is fucking stunning, guys. The little girl runs around noisily in plain fucking sight of both of them, and neither of them notice her as she stays just two feet away in order to hear everything they say. Asian guy seems to have a change of heart for no reason and wants the Indoraptor to have a mother, which is blue, and they imply that without her, it can never be empathetic. Don't you want this thing to be trained to just kill things on command? Why the hell do you need it to be empathetic if its only purpose is to kill? All you're gonna do is put it back in its cage when you don't need it anymore anyway, so why the fuck do you need it to have empathy? So the girl just happens to back down this really long hall where the Indoraptor is, and it roars, and she screams, and Hammond 2.0's son puts her in her room and locks the door. And I guess he expects that it'll keep her out of the way, which, you know, it obviously won't. Back on the boat, everyone starts moving out, and Star-Lord and Ginger Bitch hide under the car super fast. But Black Guy doesn't have their Scooby-Doo senses, so he's caught in the open and dragged off because people think he's a technician or something. Star-Lord and Ginger Bitch then decide to hijack a truck because, I guess, these guys just always have a spare truck sitting around available to hijack. Everyone starts heading toward the super secret garage that sits slightly to the left of the mansion that nobody noticed until now, complete with enormous halls big enough for goddamn Brachiosauruses to fit through. Only I think they must have gotten like a midget Brachiosaurus because in every shot we see of it from now on, the damn thing's hardly bigger than the Triceratops. Did they forget that scene from the first movie where the fucking things are enormous? But somehow, obvious bad guy Spidey senses were tingling, and he and a bunch of soldiers just randomly corner them in a truck, and they take them into custody, putting them in one of the dinosaur holding cells with all the other dinosaurs. I want you to keep in mind that these cells were meant to contain dinosaurs, not humans, because that's gonna be important in like five minutes. So anyway, Hammond 2.0's son comes to taunt them for no reason, and then tells obvious 
bad guy that they need to be kept there because they need to ensure that everyone thinks they died on the island. So like, why don't you just shoot them then? If you want to maintain the light. Then why don't you just kill them now? Why bother keeping them imprisoned if you need to make sure no one ever knows they survived the island? I'm not even talking just the they might get out perspective. I mean like seriously, they're a waste of time, money, and resources by keeping them here. It would be easier and more efficient to just shoot them and throw them in a furnace or something. It's not like you don't have the resources to just kill them. You were able to fucking capture dinosaurs off an exploding island and ship them to a mansion. You could even get lazy and just buy some anchors or something, handcuff them, and then throw them in the ocean with anchors strapped to their ankles to ensure they would never get free. Why would you keep them alive, you stupid fucks? So Hammond 2.0 calls his son into his room and he immediately accuses his son of everything the little girl did. So wait, you talk shit to her about hearing everything wrong, yet you just immediately accuse him of all the shit she did instantaneously? And he tells the guy to go pick up the phone and call the cops on himself, but instead he decides to go full-on comedy and Marcus Aurelius the shit out of his ass. But it's cut like this is some shitty Disney movie where they can't show him getting killed. So wait, we can literally watch people get eaten alive, but smothering some dude is too far? It's fucking bizarre. Like, the camera is just from Hammond 2.0's perspective, and it shows his son with a pillow coming for him. Then it hard cuts, and we see original Hammond's cane shatter on the floor for literally no reason. It's the most jarring, unnatural cut I think I've ever seen in such a high-profile, big-budget movie like this. Jesus, not even the fucking editing is good. Although I thank you for shattering Hammond's staff, because at least I can use that as an excuse to show that this series has been fucking destroyed. So Hammond 2.0's son goes to greet all the people bidding on dinosaurs, and we get lots of time with this sinister Russian who likes the killing machines. Meanwhile, the little girl manages to unlock her own door and goes on the balcony to climb all over the mansion like Spider-Man so she can sneak into Hammond 2.0's room to find out he's dead. But we never see his face. The camera just shows everything below his neck as if something horrible happened to him even though all that happened was that he was smothered with a pillow. I'm not sure why the movie thinks it needs to censor this, but okay. So she grabs his secret book and hides in the weird little elevator shaft thingy while Hammond 2.0's son comes in and calls for the old lady so she can see his steadily rotting corpse. They start to talk about the little girl and the little girl grabs a picture from inside the book and it shows the old lady but she's way younger but the little girl is photoshopped beside her. Ooh. And it turns out, I'm not even fucking kidding, that Hammond 2.0 literally cloned his daughter when she died to make the little girl and called her his granddaughter because... Why? I guess this American dude decided to clone his daughter to make her a British chick for some reason? Guess he's got a thing for accents? That's totally understandable, mind you, but whereas I go for women in their early to mid-twenties like myself who have sexy accents, I guess he goes for 11-year-old girls with sexy accents. Oh no! Anyway, she goes down the shaft and we shoot back to the auction room where everyone's bidding in the tens of millions for dinosaurs. Anyway, back in the cell, Star-Lord discovers that there's a hard boy next to them, so he keeps whispering whistling at it to piss it off so it breaks down the door to the cell. Then he lures it toward the cage door so it will burst through there and set them free. Again, their cell was just as much meant for another dinosaur as the others. Why the hell didn't they prepare for the possibility of a dinosaur being able to bash its way out? This wasn't even the most heavily armored dinosaur they had, yet it could literally cause mass destruction everywhere. Oh wait, it's a dinosaur movie. I'm not supposed to think critically about it. That's not a straw man, by the way. I have literally seen people make that argument. Apparently, Apparently because there's dinosaurs in the movie, that must mean it's immune to narrative criticism. Oh yeah, not as though the first movie made sense or anything. But no, when the fifth movie makes fuck all sense, we just have to ignore it. Anyway, so they find the little girl and coax her out of hiding by offering to teach her about dinosaurs. I don't know what the fuck they could possibly teach her that she wouldn't already know given that her grandfather was quite literally Hammond's imaginary second in command, but okay. And just in time to see the reveal of what they quite literally call the most dangerous creatures who have ever walked the earth, the yellow boy. <laughs> So, how exactly is he better than the last one? The last one literally destroyed half the park in the last movie, stayed its ground against men armed with rifles, survived a rocket launcher attack, survived a T-Rex and several raptors, and was only taken down because the writers were so lazy that they needed to create a nonsense deus ex machina that makes no logical sense whatsoever to kill it. But no, please, do tell me how I haven't done my research on dinosaurs because the fucking goddamn omniscient fish boy was able to sense the battle going on above it to 
save the day for no reason. I'm sure the mental gymnastics required to defend these fucking terrible movies will increase tenfold for this one. And believe me, the mental gymnastics are gonna have to get a lot better because oh boy does shit get retarded real soon. So despite full well knowing this is an unfinished prototype, they sell it to the Russian guy anyway because fuck, it's worth 28 million dollars. Why exactly did you make a prototype if you weren't gonna do anything with it? Also, another question, why did you need to save the dinosaurs anyway if you have eggs in your fucking basement already? You can just regrow them, you incompetent buffoons! Anyway, they show off what it can do because it's supposed to be used in the military. <sighs> Everyone fucking shit on you guys for the military angle in the last movie, yet you still went with it. Well, I guess if you're gonna be fucking retarded, you may as well be consistently fucking retarded. So here's the premise, right? You point a gun that has a laser sight on it at a target, and then you hit this button that makes a super annoying noise, and the yellow boy attacks the painted target. This is the single stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen a movie trying to make a serious point out of. You are holding a gun. Why don't you just pull the fucking trigger and shoot the thing? your painting. It's more efficient and far quicker than just making a dinosaur really mad so it'll run up and kill it a few seconds later or whatever. Hell, if you need to take out multiple targets, why don't you just use the laser-guided missile systems that we already fucking have? This makes no fucking sense. This is the kind of idea that pops into the mind of a halfwit idiot. This is so ineffective and counterintuitive to our vastly superior technology. If you want to take out a single target, just shoot the fucking target. It's not like the yellow boy is gonna be stuck healthy about it, he's gonna rip the target to pieces in as loud and obnoxious a fashion as possible. And it also dies pretty easily in this movie, so I imagine that whatever target you're painting is gonna see it ahead of time and just unload a machine gun into it first. Why the hell wouldn't you just use the guns and missiles that you already have? And literally no fucking joke, Hammond 2.0's son says this is effective because the Soviets used diseased rats in war. Yeah, the Soviets. I imagine the Russians would just launch a SAR bomber nowadays and be done with it. You do realize there's a reason why we don't use horses and diseased rats anymore, right? I mean, sure, we use dogs, but that's for, like, sniffing out bombs and shit. And guess what? Dogs also have empathy. So unless you want to breed fucking velociraptors so they can sniff out bombs in Afghanistan, why the hell would we ever want or need these in any way? I mean, what the fuck? Do you honestly think we send German shepherds in as a frontal assault force? No, we just shoot shit and blow it up. What the fuck would be the logical point to using dinosaurs in live combat. Earlier, they looked at the fucking Spike Boy and Mitchie was all like, this is a living tank. Yeah, but why the fuck wouldn't you just use a real tank? That you don't have to waste time and resources feeding, nurturing, and nursing back to health if needed when you can just get in a normal tank and blow shit up from a distance. This premise is fucking retarded. There is absolutely no cogent way to defend this idiotic bullshit. The people who thought this up should be ashamed and they should never be allowed to write anything ever again. It's like their dipshit kids told them something that they should put in a movie and without thinking about it, they did it. Star-Lord decides that he needs to fuck shit up, so he just fucks off to the middle of nowhere and happens to run back into the hard boy that helped them get out of their cage. It's just kind of wandering around doing nothing, so Star-Lord lures it to an elevator and lets it charge into the crowd of people to kill all of them. Star-Lord then becomes fucking Batman and beats the shit out of everyone like he's in a fucking video game QTE. As chaos unfolds, obvious bad guy springs into action and enters the room unbeknownst to everyone. Apparently everyone just left, so... So remember the obvious bad guy's tooth fetish? Oh, well, you're gonna fucking love the shit out of this one. So he shoots the yellow boy with two tranks and it falls over. Then he opens the cage, leaves the door open, and walks on in to fetch a tooth from this incredibly formidable predator. What the fuck is wrong with you? But get a load of this. The yellow boy isn't actually knocked out. It's faking being unconscious. Um... How? I can't imagine that it's seen too many other dinosaurs getting tranked to know what happens when you get shot by two trank darts, given that it was the only dinosaur in that facility up until that very night. No, really, how did it know that this is what happens? Some shit that the last lizard boy did was kind of ridiculous, but you're just not even fucking trying with this one, are you? So the camera's sitting right in front of the supposedly unconscious yellow boy's face while obvious bad guy tries to wrench a fucking tooth out of its mouth. We then see its tail rise up from 
from behind him, an obvious bad guy just gets a weird fucking feeling and looks back and the tail goes right back down and the yellow boy opens his eye and he gives the fucking audience a little teehee wink like this is all a fucking Scooby-Doo Cartoon Network joke. Then it closes it once the obvious bad guy looks back. Yellow boy does this shit twice. And then it's all like, fuck you, nigga, and clamps down on the bad guy's arm. Here we learn that obvious bad guy is portrayed by something I like to call a shit actor. And he hardly reacts to literally getting his entire arm violently ripped off and eaten. Also, there's like next to no blood. Ugh, can you pussies just put in blood and gore already? I can hardly take this shit seriously anyway, but it breaks immersion all the more by censoring this shit. Then it gets all up in his face and yellow boy's all like, you tried to steal my tooth. Now I'ma fuck you up, what boy. And then it fucks him up. From the side comes Midget Guy, who I guess just decided to stay in the room and hide for no reason, even though by the time Obvious Bad Guy showed up to open the cage, everyone was already gone. Why didn't he try to fucking stop him from doing that? Wouldn't he have some sway over that dipshit? So he runs to the elevator while the yellow boy's back is turned and finds several other people hiding out there. Why the fuck are you here? Why didn't you run away like everyone else long before this shit happened? Well, Midget needs needs to push them out of the way so he can hit the button to make the elevator go back down and no joke, this stupid cunt he pushes away sees the yellow boy and screams her bloody fucking head off at it. You dumb bitch, what the fuck are you doing? You didn't shriek like a fucking autistic banshee when hard boy was literally throwing people through the walls, much less when you heard yellow boy ripping this guy apart. But now that you see his puckered scaly ass, that's when you scream for no reason to create false tension by making yellow boy chase you? Well anyway, yellow boy obviously Obviously hears this and he's all like Rod chicken yo and he runs at them but the door is closed just in the nick of time and yellow boy's all like shit man they closed and his tail accidentally hits the elevator control panel and it opens the doors back up I just you did this same thing with the iPad controls in the beginning of the movie. Why do you think it needs a constant signal passed from one single button to- Anyway, Yellow Boy's all like, Cash money, motherfucker, and eats all of them. Down below, Star-Lord, Ginger Bitch, and Clone Girl are trying to escape, but run into Hammond 2.0's son, who found it necessary to explain all the exposition we've already had by saying that Hammond stopped working with Hammond 2.0 to make her a clone. He says this as if it's even remotely relevant to their situation when it- really isn't. Seriously, this movie plays out like this is some bombshell info that's supposed to affect the other characters, but it's like, what the fuck are they gonna do about it? Well, Yellow Boy X Machina comes in to kill the guards, and Star-Lord, Ginger Bitch, and Clone Girl run one way, while Hammond 2.0's son runs the other. Keep this in mind, I'm sadly not done with this yet either. So the idiot trio makes it down to the dino exhibit, where they find a random dead guy who gets pulled away. They decide to hide behind the very object the dead guy got pulled away at, and then the Yellow Boy reveals himself to already be there. Not sure how the fuck he got there so quickly, but okay. So they start circling around the object like a fucking shitty 90s cartoon again, and not only is there no trace of the guy the yellow boy literally just ate, but there is also no blood as if he was never there at all. God, the people who made this movie are fucking bitches. Then begins such an incredibly stupid chase scene, it's actually kind of hilarious. So the yellow boy stands on top of the triceratops skull that's sitting atop the object they're on, and Star-Lord breaks their cover and screams at them to run. They go up the staircase and the yellow boy snaps at them and then they get to the top and yellow boy follows like seconds later and they've somehow vanished. They then turn off the lights and just go literally right back downstairs to the exhibit. And then we cut back to goth girl and black guy who are in the labs with Blue who is now conscious and irritable as shit. And the black guy has somehow gone from being a ship technician to a scientist? How the fuck did that happen? Asian guy then starts gloating and he's all like, my raptor is perfect and pure. It bring great honor to Jurassic family. And goth girls all like, sorry, chink. I put T-Rex blood in her, so fuck your ethno state. And Asian guys all like, no, you cannot make my raptor impure. I really, really need her to be pure. You bring great dishonor to family. And then he gets knocked out and some dude hilariously drags him off to what I suppose is casting for the third movie. Goth girl and black guy then open Blue's cage and she's all like, yo, y'all bitch ass honky motherfuckers be tripping if y'all keeping my fine blue ass cooped up in this motherfucking box. Y'all be racist and shit. And then she kills the guards and gas starts leaking and then goth girl and black guy run away and Blue somehow figures out what gas is and what happens when it's near fire and she runs away and jumps out a window all like, Nigga! 
And then the room behind her explodes like this is some fucking shitty Bond film. In order to stop the progression of the gas leak, goth girl and black guy turn on the air recycling, which I guess somehow turns on the lights in the exhibit, and then the idiot trio is discovered by the yellow boy and it attacks them again. One of its claws punctures Ginger Bitch's leg, and this is meant to be all serious and shit. But like, the next time we see her, she's moving just fine, so... And the girl runs away. Star-Lord then grabs a discarded gun from the guard who magically vanished when they entered the exhibit and runs after them. The girl is chased down the hall by the yellow boy and the movie literally rips off that scene from the first movie where the girl goes in a box and then slams the door shut at the last instant and the raptor smashes its face into it. Yeah, movie, you're not good enough to pretend you're on par with the first film. Stop it. And the yellow boy decides to slowly and malevolently creep from the roof into her room and rather than just charging in and ripping her limb from limb, takes its slow ass time in making sure she's really super scared so we can get those trailer shots. But before it can eat her, Star-Lord appears and shoots it four times, then halts the attack. None of his shots did shit, somehow, and Yellow Boy's all like, oh ho ho, you being dipshit now, homie. But before the lovely massacre can begin, Blue, who somehow managed to find her way from the sub-levels of the mansion's science wing to the bedroom, breaks up the party and she's all like, get your nigga ass away from my white boy. And then the two have a bitch fight of Detroit slums proportions. Star-Lord whisks the girl away to the roof while Blue gets the shit kicked out of her, and then the yellow boy corners them on the glass roof above the exhibit. Yellow boy slowly comes toward them, and then from the other side of the roof, Ginger Bitch appears with the sound gun that she got from somewhere. How'd she even climb up there to begin with? And how did she know they were on the roof in the fucking first place? Why isn't her fucking nearly impaled leg hindering her at all? Anyway, she points the laser at Star-Lord, hoping it'll charge for him and fall through the glass roof. It does, but it catches itself and Star-Lord's all disbelieving and Yellow Boy's all like, ha, what you gonna do about that, bitch nigga? And Blue, who also managed to get on the roof, is also like, this is why you deadbeat niggas be tripping. Pay your alimony, motherfucker. And she she launches herself at the yellow boy and pushes it through the roof and it gets impaled twice by the conveniently located triceratops horns below it and it dies. Man, you guys were really betting everything you had on it just happening to fall on those horns, weren't you? Could have easily hit everywhere but the horns, but yeah, sure, okay. So they all gather in the science control center where goth girl and black guy explain that the gas is killing the dinosaurs. And the only way to save them is by opening the really big door that'll just let them all run out and live free in the world. Why there's just a huge fucking door for them to run out into the open world, I have no idea. Ginger Bitch begins immediately opening all their cages, putting all the carnivores and herbivores alike in the same room with nothing keeping them apart. Despite the fact that the fucking Carnotaurus was killing everything it saw during the cataclysmic volcanic apocalypse earlier, it and the other carnivores are just letting the other dinosaurs mill about without attacking them even though this is the best fucking excuse to kill each other ever. But Wolf, there's gas in there now. They're all too concerned with trying to escape. Oh, you mean just like in that scene in the beginning of the movie? where the volcano was erupting right behind the Carnotaurus that instead of escaping was killing everything it looked at. I guess we're going by Noah's Ark logic now, so that's great. Before she unleashes Jurassic Armageddon on the world, she has a change of heart and decides to let them all die because it's the right thing to do. But then the fucking little girl pushes the big red button anyway and her excuse, no joke, is that because she's a clone and the dinosaurs are also clones that makes them all bonded in a special way so she can't let her fellow clones die. You do realize you only just found out about being a clone like 30 minutes ago, right? Why are you suddenly so attached to them? Then we cut back to Hammond 2.0's son, who took like half a fucking hour to walk out to his car. Also, he can see all the dinosaurs get loose. He's then killed in the ridiculous fashion that the babysitter from the last movie was killed by getting ripped apart in a fight between the Carnotaurus and the T-Rex, who both really wanted to eat him, so he's eaten by both I guess. And there's all this heroic music because for some bizarre fucking reason the T-Rex is the hero all the time. You do realize it was never the hero in the first movie, right? Like, it didn't just benevolently save them for no reason. It was just hunting and ate 
the Raptors because they were in the building. It wasn't fucking Superman. This is an incredibly dangerous and lethal predator that kills people all the time. How has every fucking subsequent movie to come after the first managed to completely misinterpret this scene and think that the T-Rex is a fucking good guy? It's fucking not. Anyway, so Star-Lord goes up to Blue and he's all like, come with us, we can take you to safety. And Blue's all like, hmm, baby honey, y'all cray cray for not hitting up them drug dealers up in the city. I hear y'all got this stuff called crystal meth. I'ma go find a dealer and hit him up, so I gotta split again. Yo, but don't worry, this here moving makers all be fucking stupid ass white niggas and they're gonna bait the shit out of me coming back since I'm now the fucking face of this here franchise. So we'll meet again eventually, even if it don't make no motherfucking sense. So I'm gonna go get shit faced. See ya later, honkers. And then completely forgetting that goth girl and black guy were even in the movie to begin with, Star-Lord, Ginger Bitch, and Clone Girl drive off into the sunset and we get those clips from the trailer showing the T-Rex roaring at the lion and the fish boy about to eat the surfer. We don't even see any resolutions to either scene. Those clips were literally seen in their entirety in the trailers. There's nothing more to them. They're just brief little clips mashed in at the end for, well, probably just for the trailers. And then we're reminded that Jeff Goldblum was in this movie and he's all like, welcome to Jurassic World. And then the movie ends. God, this movie was fucking so dumb. I actually felt retarded after watching this movie. Do you ever just watch movies now and ask yourself, why and how are these idiots getting writing jobs in Hollywood? This movie was all spectacle and nothing else. This was literally almost as bad as The Last Jedi in terms of its writing being so unbelievably stupid that it's actually kind of amazing this shit was ever released. You know, I said it in my Jurassic World Media Reloaded, and I'm going to say it again here, I don't know how in the hell there are fans of this series. Every single movie has gotten progressively worse. There is one good Jurassic Park movie, and it's the first one. Otherwise, somehow, they keep lowering the bar. Fuck, this movie was even worse than the last one. Much worse than the last one. Not only was the editing just humiliatingly terrible, but the plot was so jumbled that at times it made absolutely no sense at all. At least the first Jurassic World was somewhat coherent. It was retarded, but you understood how one thing led to another for the most part. In this movie, nothing added up. It was like they had four different films mashed together and they had no idea how to pull it all in. This movie had a first act and then an extremely long and extremely boring second act. And then it just cut to the conclusion of the third act without the rest of the substance. The Indoraptor dies so fucking quickly and so fucking easily that it begs the question of why they even had it in the movie in the first place. The villains are Dumber than ever, the protagonists not only are virtually different characters from the last film, but are infinitely stupider. The music was one note, cliche, poorly utilized mystery drivel that didn't have a single good track in the entire experience. Hell, the only track I remembered was the main one, which played in the fucking credits. While there were a few genuinely beautiful shots on the island, the editing was so bad and so janky and at times bordering on absolute incompetence that it's like they had one guy film a few good shots and another guy to film the rest of the movie, which ranged from looking bland to looking outright awful. The use of animatronics was hardly noteworthy. What few instances of animatronics were used were overshadowed by the immense amount of CGI that looked just as poor as the last films. Sound design was dreadful in many areas, the sound of dinosaurs eating people sounding muffled and distorted, and the goddamn T-Rex roar sounding fucked up. It was way too quiet, it seemed like it was mixed badly, and almost tricked me into thinking it was a new sound altogether, which is dumb because that sound is incredibly iconic to this franchise. Chris Pratt's acting was the only good part of the movie, and there were at least a couple moments where it looked like he didn't know whether or not he was in a serious movie or a comedy. Probably because I couldn't even fucking tell if this was supposed to be a serious movie or a comedy. But god damn was this horribly written. I am willing to say that if you genuinely thought even a single line or scene in this movie was well written, you might actually have severe brain damage. This was so fundamentally broken and idiotic that I can't fathom how anyone could even possibly enjoy this. I can see how the first movie movie could be something you could sit down and laugh at, but there was literally no entertainment to be had here. When the movie ended, the guys sitting in front of me looked at each other and one guy was like, that movie fucking sucked. Maybe it's a result of people finally starting to catch on to the fact that movies are getting worse and worse nowadays, or maybe it's just that this movie was just that bad. But no, it's a dinosaur movie, so bad writing is forgiven. What a stupid fucking thing to say, by the way. Because a movie covers a certain topic, it's immune to criticism? That's just a big fuck you to the first film. That movie was about 
about dinosaurs and it was a good movie that made sense. It still had problems, mind you, but it's by and large an amazing film. It's actually really pathetic that people are defending this shit. Not just Jurassic World 2, not just Star Wars, but I mean bad writing in general. I'm seriously starting to wonder if this is a symptom of the abysmal reading and writing levels in the United States right now because this is where a lot of this shit stems from. Not all of it, mind you, but well, most of the defenders are American and a lot of the people writing bad movies now are American. I get a lot of shit from people who think I just blindly hate everything. I just have a lot more to say about the things I hate than the things I like. I have started talking about things I enjoy lately though, and I gotta say, I actually do kind of like talking about good things from time to time, but it's the bad things that really taint the good. But when we look at shit like Jurassic World 2 or The Last Jedi and completely ignore the goddamn mountainous list of enormous problems that fundamentally break the story and characters in a thousand different ways, then that just drags down good movies. If we say dog shit like this movie is actually unironically good, then we're spitting in the face of writers and filmmakers that go above and beyond and not only make true art, but write masterful narratives that captivate and touch us. I'm not saying you can't get enjoyment out of this movie. I know that's everyone's favorite straw man to go with whenever they don't have an actual refutation, but when I criticize a movie, I'm not saying you can't personally have fun with it. I don't know how the hell you can, but hey, I'm a furry. What the fuck do I know? My appreciation for a certain art style means my opinion is invalid, I guess, even though that's not even remotely relevant to the conversation being had in the first place. What I am saying is that we shouldn't just accept this shit. There's a reason why movies in general are suffering from an enormous writing problem nowadays. It's not a coincidence that nearly every movie now is released with such enormous writing problems that it's mind-boggling to look at. This is entirely due to people actually misconstruing this as well-written without actually thinking about the implications of how it's written. When you start breaking everything down and you realize that motivations and plot points make absolutely no sense in any given context and you have to start making up excuses for it, then you've encountered what is indefinitely bad writing. This is an objective flaw. Plot holes, logical fallacies, inconsistencies, and idiotic dialogue are all symptoms of writers that do not think. Bad writing is objective and is measurable and can be the very thing that destroys a movie, game, book, comic, or show. And it's currently running rampant across all forms of narrative-driven entertainment. Only by recognizing, acknowledging, and battling against the problem can we come to a definitive resolution, but saying shit like this is well-written sure as shit ain't gonna do that. Before I go, I want to give a shout out to a good friend of mine, Mauler. Just like what I've encountered with my first Jurassic World video and what I'm definitely encountering with this one, he's been hit numerous times by Zephyr Universal, who manually claim videos regardless of whether they're fair use or not and block them. And only after they're backed into a corner after multiple disputes and appeals will they finally back off. That, or they'll put a strike on your YouTube account and double down until it gets to lawsuit area. Yes, I have a strike on my account for my completely fair use video of the first Jurassic World. A strike of which I am going to battle against, and if they try to push any legal charges, I'm going to battle against that too, and I'm going to win because I know what fair use is. But anyway, Mauler's doing this shit for a living, and he's missed out on an absolute assload of potential views, subscribers, and most of all money, all because Zephyr decided to fuck him over on his hard work. He's a genuinely great YouTuber, and his video on Jurassic World 2 is both informative and hilarious. And if you like tea-drinking hedonistic faggots who use their venomous accents to trick you into thinking they're smart, then you'll love his piece of shit videos. The link to his video is in the description below.